we are. Hafade, good morning. The Committee on Health and Human Services, Health Insurance Reform, Economic Development, and Senior Citizens now convenes this public and confirmation hearing. Public hearing notices were given to the media, first notice on Tuesday, November 18th, and second notice on Wednesday, November 26th. For the record, today is Wednesday, December 3rd, 2014, and the time now is 10.02 a.m. The committee will hear and accept testimonies, both oral and written, on uh, the following. The first one is the executive appointment of Dr. Gregory Miller to serve as a member of the Guam Board of Allied Health Examiners. The executive appointment of Ms. Linda R.P. Perez to serve also as a member of the Guam Board of Allied Health Examiners. Bill 416, an act to add a new Article 2 to Chapter 58, 12 GCA relative to encouraging the development of 1,600 new hotel rooms to the issuance of special qualifying certificates. And Bill 422-32, an act to provide for the isolation and quarantine procedures relative to an emergency detention order for the incubation periods of severe communicable diseases as determined by the U.S. Center of Disease Control. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning. I want to recognize a uh, former colleague, uh, Senator Mana Silva Tyron. Thank you very much, Senator, for being here, and all of you uh, for being here this morning. We'll start off the hearing uh, with the appointments of Dr. Miller and uh, Ms. Linda Perez. Um, if you wish to provide any testimony, I ask you to please um, sign uh, up here in the forms that are um, to the left of us here in this table. I'd like to recognize uh, the Vice Chair of the Committee, Senator Tony Ada, and also Senator Frank Uggen, Jr. Thank you very much for joining me this morning. Um, okay, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Miller and um, Ms. Paris. We don't have, uh, we have one, uh, Mana Silva Tyron, who wishes to, um, who signed up in, in favor of the appointment of um, Ms. Paris, and also in favor of the appointment of uh, Dr. Greg Miller. Uh, would you like to provide a testimony, Senator? Not, if not, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Miller, good morning. Congratulations uh, on the on the reappointment. I know that you are um, your current member now, and this is your reappointment into the Board of Allied Health Examiners. That's correct. And yeah. so um, we're here now to um, um, go through your confirmation hearing. If you have any um, um, statements you'd like to provide the committee, you're free to do so now. Well, basically, I think uh, currently everything's going pretty smooth with the Board of Allied Health. Uh, we're just we're still short several members. Uh, we don't have a physical therapist, uh, veterinarian, uh, and a couple other ones, right, Linda? So we'd be happy if we can uh, complete the board. But outside of that, uh, I think so far everything's going pretty smooth with the board. I'll be honest with you, I think probably our major hang up seems to be the Open Meeting Act and getting it right. Um, most of the stuff that's gone through litigation on our board has been thrown back at us simply because, like, when you opened the meeting, you gave the day and the dates of your, of your uh, advertisements through the Guam Open Meeting Act. And we do that, but a part of it is the board office that controls all the boards does not always have the money to run the ads. And some, so every once in a while they're, like, late or something like that, and that messes up the whole meeting schedule. And I think probably, and Linda might probably agree with that, that's probably one of our biggest hang-ups right now is just compliance with that. And uh, I don't know, maybe that might take a little bit of tweaking. But outside of that, I think it's a pretty good board. Everything's going pretty smooth. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So what I'll do, I'll just have um, Ms. Perez also do her opening, and then if there's any questions from the senators, then we'll, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Congratulations to you as well. This is a re-appointment, um, and so um, you've been there now for how many years? Uh, I have three years. Three years, okay. Okay, can yeah. we just turn on your mic? So, yes. And doctor I, can turn off yours, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I've been on the board for three years, and I am very grateful for the reappointment. Um, I, be, I believe I've been very instrumental in carrying out uh, what the community, the public expects of us as board members and also as professionals, uh, especially in the hospital. Um, I say instrumental to where our standards have been raised, that the requirements for any professional practicing in the hospital uh, in terms of respiratory uh, is that they are 
educated, they have schooling, they are credentialed, and they're licensed to practice. So I can assure the public that um, that's been met. And we will continue to, to work at uh, improving our services um, and having the community and those governing bodies, the legislature, the governors, the lieutenant governor to assist us in any way uh, possible to help us continue to provide the best care we can to the public. Um, we've traveled many rough roads, the board, and Greg, that's what Greg has mentioned is exactly one of the stuff that has, or one of the things that have really affected us. But we have identified as a whole what are the things that need to be um, addressed, and I'm sure some have met with you, Senator Rodriguez, and um, we will continue to push forward the issues that we believe need to be addressed as soon as possible in order for us to be a, a, a very professional, very uh, diligent board to serve the legislature and to serve the people as well. Right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pierce. And yes, uh, Doc, uh, we've, um, uh, we have a meeting next week with the, the licensing office with Marlene and Roma from Public Health because we know that there are um, continuing uh, continued struggles. Uh, that office uh, does a lot uh, for the many boards that it has under them. Um, with, um, you know, and so we're looking at ways to see how we can um, um, provide the support that's needed. Um, for them so that you can also, the different boards can operate uh, more efficiently and effectively. Uh, but if there are, uh, I know, and uh, yes, I do meet with uh, Dr. Balahaja. She's still your chair, right? Correct. She's the chair. And so she's always, she's always bringing up um, uh, concerns. And I know that when she gets back, um, there's, uh, we're supposed to meet with members of the board as well, uh, with you folks to see how we can um, move things forward. Um, I just wanted to add to what Greg had mentioned. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, other entities that need to be on the board. Uh, laboratory, radiology. Um, Physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, veterinary medicine has no representative. Uh, there's, I believe, slots for either nine or 11 members. There's 15 professions actually that are represented by that board. It makes it very unique because like in medicine, they only license uh, medical doctors and osteopathic uh, physicians. So it's very easy to promulgate rules and regulations, to know those rules and regulations. But allied health is very unique because with 15 professions, the people who are on that board need to know all the rules for all the professions, especially for the ones that are not represented. And uh, so it makes it a little bit more of a challenge too. That's right. Okay, I'll open it up. But before that, I'd like to also recognize Mrs. Miller. Thank you very much uh, for, for being here. It takes a lot because uh, you guys have, you have your, your professions, mm -hmm. um, what you do, your, your day jobs, right? Right. <laughs> and so you do a lot of work, but you still have time to provide the service to our community. So I really thank you very much for them. Thank your families for the support as well. Uh, Great. Senator Adder. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't have any questions. I'd just like to thank uh, both Dr. Miller and Ms. Paris for uh, again, availing yourself to the to the board, and you know, looking forward to uh, working with you, and uh, hopefully that uh, those issues with the open open government will be resolved, and uh, we'll see that um, the smoother uh, uh, meetings and things like that will uh, happen on the board. And uh, anything that we can do to help you uh, achieve that, uh, please let us know. Yeah, we'll be working with I'd you. just like to respond to that. I think really, as far as the open meeting law, it's not. It's kind of a lot of stuff. It could be tweaked a little bit. Uh, actually, I'd like to see that law, and I worked with uh, Senator Benjamin Cruz about that, to allow that law to work only through web, or to allow the meeting notices to be via websites or, or like the new government TV channel. But our AG, who represents our board, says, no, it still has to be in the paper along with that and the paper costs money. So really it's a financial issue right now. And uh, if you work with uh, Marlene Carbolito's uh, people, uh, they would be eternally grateful if they could you just help it so that when we post our meeting notices, they're about 200 and some dollars per meeting. And, uh, and then we get off cycle, then we have to reschedule the meeting and buy new ads. 
So it's very tough on, on the board office to come up with that money, and sometimes it's very last minute. So we don't know if we're going to have a meeting or not. And then, of course, I don't have to reschedule patients because luckily they're during lunch time. But for like our FHP representative and even our, our respiratory therapist, a lot of times they're rescheduling patients to be at these meetings, and the meetings are canceled because if the purchase order didn't go through. So I think mostly, I think the people from the office would probably say, before you do anything in law, just if we can have a, a way of advertising those meetings that's either funded well or can be totally on a website, uh, that would be ideal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Ogden? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Dr. Miller and morning. Ms. Perez. Thank you for offering your assistance to our community. Just a couple of questions, and, and you, you hit on the issue with regards to the public notification for meetings, because uh, I was under the impression that the most recent change, amendments to the law, would authorize as an alternative either electronic notification or public notification, let's say, in the government TV. So that, I think, has to be clarified. I know you, you alluded to your AG's representative legal counsel saying that in fact it, it has to be both. So I think uh, I need to revisit that particular because at the, uh, one of the premise of that amendment when it was going through this body is allowing for the flexibility now with electronic media and different forums that are available to allow our government entities to be able to provide public notification through other uh, mediums. So I will uh, see how the vice speaker would like to proceed with this because I know it was his legislation. I would love it if you do that, because I sat with the vice speaker just about two years ago. We came up with this yeah. idea, and then it was passed. Everything yes. would work perfect, but she probably admit this. I've come close to arguing with our AG. I said, no, we can use websites, and now we have a TV channel. And his retort was, no, at the last minute in the third reading, the print media came in and added and whether there was, there was an or. He says, you still have to do the newspaper. But he's the only one who's ever said that. And he's like, he's asking me to prove it to him. But if your office can come up with proof or something like that that says, yeah, you can use a uh, develop a website, but why use a website? We've got this great government TV channel, which according to when they announced it, it was to announce meetings. Mm -hmm. Which I think the only logistical problem I think on that would be having some sort of affidavit that our meeting was on that TV channel at the right dates, because you have these dates. But I think that could be done by whoever manages the channel. But if your office can contact us once you find out, and if it's true that a website or the TV channel satisfies that law, you would solve a whole lot of financial problems. Because, uh, well, Marlene could probably tell you the amount of money, because all those boards and all those notices add up to a lot of money. And that's probably why the print media wants it the other way, too. So. <laughs> okay. Well, well, obviously, we, we definitely don't want to take away from the requirement that, in fact, our people have that opportunity to acknowledge that there's a meeting for different boards and commissions out there. So I think it's, it's something that we certainly need to go back and revisit. Um, just a couple of other questions. I, I know, Dr. Miller, you alluded to, and Ms. Parrish, you alluded to the membership. Uh, you may possibly have 15 positions available for various specialties and uh, you've only been able to fill perhaps seven or eight. Now, in the last year alone, have you had any issues with regards to quorum aside from your scheduled meetings? No, we've never missed a meeting due to lack of quorum. Okay. And the reason I bring this up is because I was speaking to a medical professional not too long ago, maybe about a couple months back. And he shared with me that he's having difficulties getting doctors who were originally from Guam certified to come back to Guam and serve in our community. And there's one particular doctor that he's tried to recruit. And he received the initial commitment. And they're, they're going through this certification and this authorization to practice here on island. And unfortunately, he's experiencing some severe, serious difficulties to the point where the doctor who's now practicing off-island is reconsidering his option of coming to Guam and serving here in our community. So uh, that's why I wanted to inquire about the quorum, whether in fact there's any difficulty because obviously the process has to proceed. I know of three uh, locally grown uh, and professionally educated and who are now practicing doctors in the mainland who would like to come back home. 
and serve in this community. And they're, they're going through the process right now of getting that certification and that authorization to be able to practice on island. So it's very critical, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure you're very much aware of this, that the impaneling of this body uh, continues and that every effort be made to try to pursue other individuals in the community who would like to serve in this position because anytime that we're bringing in a professional to provide direct service to our people, we need to not only provide that direct cer certification but an assurance to our community that these individuals are readily av available and properly credentialed to serve in our community. So I wanted to, to bring that to your attention and, and we can have a sidebar discussion in terms of how the process actually works and if there's anything that my office can do in terms of communicating with uh, this particular uh, locally grown doc now doctor to possibly continue to consider his option of coming back uh, to Guam and serving in this community. I, I certainly would like to work with the Board of Allied Health and the Chairman to try to realize that. Um, as aside from that, I just wanted to once again thank you very much for offering yourself and your service to our community. And this is obviously a volunteer effort on your part to try to ensure that uh, the, re the regulations and the restrictions and the policies that are required by the board, the Allied Board of Medical Examiners, that you, you have that opportunity to oversee our medical professionals in the community. And, and I commend you and I thank you very much for that. And please continue to seek the, the support of the chairman or uh, any of the members of this legislature in terms of any legislation or policy that you may, would need to have us reconsider or you would recommend that we reconsider. Thank you very much. Just a brief comment on that, too. I'm not sure which board. It sounds like it might be medical physicians. But either way, I think one of the problems we have with off-island healthcare providers, whether they're medical doctors or chiropractors or PTs or whatever, is, you know, I'm going to put a plug in for our, our hardworking board staff, is they're, like a lot of GovGuam agencies, that they need more funds. And for healthcare to grow properly on Guam, especially as the hospital, uh, regional medical, starts to recruit more and more physicians, there are times where the fax machine doesn't work, uh, they need an upgraded computer system, and probably, probably at least a couple more employees. Uh, because there's a lot of licensees on Guam, uh, and there's just not enough money to go around. Uh, just simply updating the hardware, uh, some fax machines, phone lines, all that stuff. Because I'll hear stories where people say, OK, I'm trying to renew, but my fax won't go through. I'm sending in my stuff, you know? And you know, you'll call down there and say, well, it's, it's not working right now. It's simple stuff like that. Because uh, I know of a doctor, I think it was Dr. Shea, who told me that somebody in the States got so frustrated just trying to get this information in. And they said, I don't think I want to go there, you know? It's, it's just too. I don't get it, so they back off. So I think just even taking care of simple logistics would make it smoother for most doctors, you know. Um, outside of that, I think uh, it would go pretty smooth. I'd I like to add to what Greg is saying. Um, yes, definitely, we have a problem with the office. There's not a lot of staff to assist a lot of uh, licensees that are trying to get information or even trying to get their application in on a timely manner. Um, sometimes the phones, no one's answering the phone. And these are the complaints I'm hearing from people. And I don't even know if this is the forum to do it, but if you want to hear it, the complaints I'm hearing are no one's answering the phone uh, when they're calling in. Uh, when they do come, the, the office of operation hours um, are limited. The other thing is the, uh, the web page. Our government can save a lot of money if the web page is available. People can access the uh, information regarding our our profession, access applications. They can access uh, other information that's pertinent to filling up their application or the requirements uh, for licensure here. So, if the office is not available for them, what other options do they have? And I worked in the mainland, I lived in the mainland as well. And our web page were up and running. We could easily access, we could easily communicate, um, and we can submit our application in a timely manner. But because we don't have a web page here, I mean, even for a lot of professionals to look at the, the Guam laws, they have to go into the legislature's website just to understand our laws. 
So that is frustration for a lot of us. Um, and of course I hear it, and I understand. I get frustrated, we get frustrated. We understand that Marlene doesn't have a lot of staff members with her helping her out. And it's not just one board that she's working with. She's dealing with several other boards, the nursing board, the medical board, the Guam Board of Ally Health. That's a lot for, I think, three people to man. How many applications, how many licensures, how many um, people are there that want to come and work? There's just a lot for them to handle. So, yes, those are the things that are um, kind of being hindrances to, to the people. Um, I, I understand, and I, I really appreciate this conversation, and obviously the focus is on your reappointment, and you both certainly have my support, but, uh, you know, these are, are real issues that are affecting either potential applicants or existing physicians and professionals that are serving our community, so uh, if you can direct any uh, inquiry or any suggestions or any requests to the chairman so that we can address it, because uh, obviously with the ad addition of the Guam Medical City, hospital and then GMH, some of our professionals are now transferring over to that new facility. GMH is going to have to cover down and, and make sure that they're able to effectively recruit also professionals and medical physicians to be able to serve at our public hospital. So, I mean, there's, there's really a lot. And then we also have expansions of other clinics that are ongoing that uh, may be opening in a few months. One I know for a fact will be opening their expanded facility in a few months and they need medical professionals. So, I mean, we're at a, a very critical time where we need to provide you the support. And whether it's logistics, uh, whether it's additional personnel, whether it's a fax machine, we need to try to work collectively with the powers that be in the executive branch so that we can address these issues. And those will not be the issues. The issues really should be, are you properly credentialed? Will you... Uh, do you meet all the specifics and the requirements that your board and your commission requires for you to sign off and approve their application or their recertification? That, that sh really should be your focus and not necessarily on logistical concerns and issues because that should be, be rolling as, as smoothly as possible. So please bring some of these concerns to, to the chair and we'll work with the chairman and see what we can do to, to facilitate and, and assist the, co the commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, again, thank you very much and congratulations on your uh, reappointment. We'll make sure that the committee report is ready uh, for a session that's um, going to happen later this month. And the concerns that were raised, um, th these are concerns that uh, we'll continue to work with uh, uh, the board and also with public health. The deputy director is here. He heard all the concerns. And so um, the licensing office is under the Department of Public Health. So we'll make sure that we address these, um, these uh, concerns moving forward. Okay. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is um, Bill 416, uh, an act to add a new Article 2 to Chapter 5812 GCA. I'd like to now call up um, Senator Tyron, uh, Tina Garcia, Mr. David John, Milton Morinaga, and John St. Nicholas. I think we can pull up one more chair. And um, Carl uh, and Mr. Carl Pangolinen. There you go. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for being here this, this morning. Um, Bill uh, 416. Um, what this bill is, it, it, it's relative to encouraging the development of 1,600 new hotel rooms through the issuance of special qualifying certificates to hotel developers and provide for a qualifying certificate abeyance pending development of industry specific criteria. What this is that is we worked uh, very closely with, with GIDA even during uh, Carl's time. Um, and I'd um, like to thank also Mr. David John, who uh, the board member who was um, tasked to um, put a committee together and work this through, and also with Ms. Tina Garcia, who was very instrumental in um, moving this thing forward. Um, what this does now is, is amends the current um, statute on QCs for, for hotels. And the, the, plan, the plan that we had moving forward is that we're going to look at all the industries we have 
um, on our books, on what QCs that we provide um, to investors, and see how we could um, um, reestablish and, and re really just change the way things are. Because the way it is now is really open-ended. You have a QC program that um, uh, for any given um, industry can be uh, abated or rebated 100% of their taxes um, with very little investment. Um, if, you know, and that's something that we've seen in, in s several specific industries. And so what we wanted to do was really tighten it up, make it really attractive to investors, but also uh, provide our people um, with the... Um, the, the value that these QCs are, are supposed to be. It's supposed to be given um, to investors who provide a need to our community. At the same time, um, you know, ensure the community um, benefits from, from these investments. And so um, this is what we have in front of us, um, in which we know that working with the Guam Visitors Bureau, that uh, more hotel rooms are needed in our island. And so we're working towards that um, towards that goal. But also the um, second part of this um, bill has a provision that would um, um, that would put uh, that that would establish an abeyance um, of um, any future QCs moving forward in any in different industries. And I know that this is a concern. I know we've read um, the um, testimony of Gita, and we can discuss this further. But what this really is is that. Um, it's not, it's not closing up shop. It's not saying that we're not going to have any QCs. We know that the QCs are a very important tool. Um, I've shared that with you, and I think that's a policy that has been established by this body as well. Um, but what we'd like to do is, just like we did with this hotel, uh, special hotel QC, is look at all the different industries and look at what is the real need of our community, um, you know, of this industry, what we need to bring in, what kind of investments we need to bring in. And from there, we're giving it to, we're giving the flexibility to Gita to develop the, 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 the process, um, to develop a measurable um, uh, formula that would ensure that X number of dollars of investment would, would translate into a X amount of rebate or abatement for those um, invested dollars, and then what can still the, the community benefit from it. And so that's, um, that's where we're at here. And I know that um, uh, there, there may be some concern about about that, um, but it's not saying that we're, we're we're ending the QC program. For me personally, I want to state for the record, I support it, and, and you know I support it, and we want to expand it. But I think before expanding it further, we need to ensure that there are um, tight measures in place, uh, just like what we're doing for this um, special QC program. Okay, so um, Senator, you can go ahead and start with your statement. Thank you. Uh, this testimony is uh, given on behalf of uh, our administrator, Mr. John A. Rios. Hoffaday Chairman, Senator Dennis Rodriguez, and members of the Committee on Health and Human Services, Health Insurance Reform, Economic Development, and Senior Citizens, thank you for allowing me to provide testimony on Bill 41632LS. Gita partially supports Bill 4416. We oppose any abeyance of the QC program. As Gita has testified before the legislature in the past, the qualifying certificate or QC program is the single most unique and important investment tool that allows Guam to compete with other Asian and US domiciles. It's been a successful marketing program enticing billions of dollars to Guam since its inception, most especially in the hotel and tourism industry. While the program offers tax rebates and abatements, it has created numerous industries, thousands of jobs for our locals, and has helped in Gita's role in building a strong economy. As Guam expects exponential growth and investment, any moratorium on Guam's only investment tool, qualifying certificates, will hamper our efforts to compete in the global market, to entice investment, and to grow new industries. Without the QC program, Gita will no longer be able to require companies to provide employment to local residents ensure participation in managing tra uh, training programs, and support local community programs. Gita supports the intent of this bill, however. We do strongly oppose any abeyance of the QC program, industry-specific or otherwise. Bill 416 would provide for a special tax incentive for special or specific to hotels. As you are aware, our visitor arrivals has grown significantly over the last several years, hitting 1.3 million visitors in 2013. With further growth expected in the tourism industry, it is now necessary to meet the growing demand for hotel rooms. In line with the Guam Visitors Bureau's Vision 2020 plan, our goal is to build 1,600 additional hotel rooms by 2020. This special tax incentive 
is intended to immediately spur new hotel room developments and will also allow for the expansion of existing ones. The qualifying certificate or QC program since its inception has been a successful tool in Gita's efforts to entice investment into Guam and we believe that this simplified version will make the program even more attractive. In addition, the benefits derived for both the investor, the government and the community are clear from the beginning to include the following. Tax benefits are pegged at 10% of construction costs, making clear to both the GovGuam and the developer the dollar amount of taxes to be rebated. This new program will entice reluctant developers shying away because of naturally high development costs versus Asia. The new program provides flexibility to the QC beneficiary as the law sets forth a menu of tax benefits they can utilize at their discretion until the predetermined benefit amount is exhausted. Research shows that the preferred form of tax incentives are those that provide for faster recovery of investment costs. Community contribution amounts are more transparent at 0.5% of construction costs and further sets forth the limitations on the use of those funds. This bill puts a sunset provision on this incentive that in addition to the time limit has a maximum QC volume. When the volume is hit, the program will be reviewed and based on the public input may be extended an additional two years by the GITA board resolution. We thank you for, your oppor for the opportunity to provide testimony on Bill 41632, and we look forward to your favorable consideration. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, just before I move on, just to uh, direct you to page seven of the bill. And I know that um, uh, the, the abeyance um, portion provision of this bill, and I'll read, it, I'll read to you uh, sub-item B, general industry specific, abeyance thereof, new, no new qualified certificates or the renewal of qualified certificates shall be approved and issued until such time as the Guam Economic Development Authority has developed pursuant to Article 3 of Chapter 9, 5 GCA, industry specific policy regulations criteria and measurable goals ensuring the appropriate stimulation of legitimate investment of new economic development and which shall not include industry specific development projects already already satisfactorily established on guam so as to ensure that the government not unnecessarily waive needed revenue for an industry specific project category that already exists or is satisfactory, satisfactorily established and the next sub-item C, the Guam Economic Development Authority shall submit by no later than January 30, 2015, the proposed pro promulgated industry-specific policy regulations criteria and measurable goals of the legislature for approval. So what, what this does is that, you know, there, there's no, um, we're not saying QCs are, are dead. That's it. We're saying we support QCs. What, what we want to do is, is bring it back to you guys. You guys are the ones. I mean, I think you're the professional. You're the subject matter experts on this, right? Is that you look at um, the industries that need to be, um, that, that we need to offer QCs as an incentive and then bring back to us, just like you've done here with a, with a special hotel QC. And so I just want to make it very clear that um, this legislation does not put a hold um, uh, long term into any um, um, QCs. It's, we're, we're, we're bringing it back to Gita. So it's up to Gita to now to, so if you, you think this is a very important um, um, tool that is needed, that Gita develop the, the necessary um, um, criteria moving forward. So just want to make that clear because I think there's that um, there's concerns also brought up that this is um, putting a, a stop to any QCs and that um, you know we're we're not going to be attractive, but that's um, that's not the case. We just want to make sure that we do it right and that uh, the investments that are 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 are, are done and the the um, taxes that are abated um, that the community also has a, a has some value to that. Okay, so that that's something I want to make clear. Okay, um, Ms. Tina Garcia. Do you have a testimony to no? Okay. Mr. David John, um, who's a member of the um, GITA board. Good morning, happy day. Um, for the record, my name is David John. I'm vice chairman of the Guam Economic Development Authority and the chair on the committee and qualifying certificate programs. I'm here to conditionally testify in support of Bill 416-32. The Guam qualifying certificate program has a history of helping develop industries and jobs on Guam. Nevertheless, it has been criticized within the community. Some of the criticism is warranted. However, it's my personal opinion that much of the criticism stems from a misunderstanding of the benefits given to beneficiaries, as well as a misconception of the benefits recipient companies have provided the community with the overall structure of the program. I know I certainly misunderstood some of the benefits prior to coming on the board. 
From a structural standpoint, the existing QC program has the following shortcomings. It's difficult to measure how much tax benefits we're giving to the beneficiary company on an absolute dollar basis. The timing of the QC negotiations often result in QCs being given after the investment is pledged, which is counterintuitive. It's expensive for admin the administration on both GIDA's level and as the beneficiary company level due to the complexity of the program. It's an open-ended program and the lack of input from the legislature and the community as a whole. With this in mind, the board requested our committee to review the existing program and to provide some ideas on how to improve it. When we first started working on the project, our goal was to clean up the, the, the current program as it, as, it, as it stood. However, the more we analyzed the current program, the more we realized that the existing pro program attempted to provide investment incentives to multiple industries with li little common um, uh, use within the, within the, uh, the, the industries on it with a single mandate. With this, we decided early on that a better approach would be to write a series of QCs that are industry specific have a sunset provision to make sure the program is reviewed by the community stakeholders on a periodic basis. We're easily measurable from a benefit structure, as well as simple to administer for both GIDA and the beneficiary company. Bill 4316-32 uh, represents our efforts in drafting industry-specific QCs, our first efforts. In designing each of these QCs, the first question the committee will ask is what is the reasoning behind giving up tax revenue? What is the benefit to the island? We determined that there's, that there's four general answers to this question. The beneficiary will provide a community benefit to the hospital, i.e. the hospital. Uh, the QC will establish a new industry. An example of that would have been the hydroponic QC we worked on last year or two years ago. The QC will encourage an industry to remain on Guam that otherwise would not have been here. For example, the captive insurance industry, uh, stress captive. Uh, and the QC is a sector that is a catalyst for growth in the community. Bill 416, I'm having trouble with my numbers this morning. Uh, check me for stroke. Uh, 32 <laughs> fits the final mandate. To grow our tourism, we need more hotel rooms as, as well as better stock of rooms to help grow the industry. More tourism re tourists result in more spending and more jobs to the community. More specifically, Bill 416-32 is designed to support Vision 2020's quest to build 1,600 rooms by 2020. The design is as followed. While there are multiple companies looking to build hotels in Guam, most are attempting to figure out what the island will do or when the China visa is coming. With this, the QC is written to provide the benefits to the first 1,600 rooms. However, the QC will be pulled back if the China visa is established. This is not to say that we shouldn't have a QC at that point in time. It just means that the industry conditions would have changed dramatically due to this decision. And with this, the stakeholders, to include the legislature, should have an opportunity to provide input into what's needed at that point in time. Additionally, we believe that each QC should be reviewed every uh, five years to make sure it remains relevant. Um, if it is, we can extend it as is. If not, make adjustments at that point in time. The benefits under the QC are easily defined. The, ben the QC will provide benefits up to 10% of the new investment uh, and can be used in a, a baited or refunded status. Uh, the BPT, uh, up to 50% of taxes within 20 years. Use tax, up to 100% of tax with respect to property used to construct, furnish, and equip the new hotel or its expansion. Income tax, 75% within 20 years. And property tax, 100% within t 10 years. While some of the benefits extend 20 years, if the project's successful, the 10% cap will be hit much earlier. So our goal is to get the QC off the books within 10 years or quicker if we can. That's one of the keys to this. Lastly, the beneficiary will need to make a community contribution equivalent to a half a percent, uh, resulting in a net benefit of about 9.5%. The goal is to use the QC as a blueprint for additional industry-specific QCs, and it's our hope that the legislature will support the structures so that we can move forward with this. However, there's, I guess we've, we've already addressed it in nauseam here, but there's one change we'd like to see, and that's under Bill Section 3, the bill discusses the abeyance of a new QCs under a new industry-specific QC um, is placed into law. While it's our goal to provide new QCs in a timely manner, we also need to acknowledge that the QCs are GITA's biggest and best tool in incentivizing new investment in Guam. 
With this, we'd like to request an adjustment to this language. I think we're close. Um, instead of an abeyance, we'd like to see the section changed to any QC applications that do not fall within each of the new industry specific QCs as we're drafting them, that we would bring it to the legislature before, an act, before approving the QC process. So you'd have your, 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 uh, your, your ability to, to put your con, uh, consent on it also. But we believe that this will provide the oversight you're looking for while still allowing Guy to the opportunity to negotiate QCs as we're building the program. Again, I think it really comes down to a wording issue more than, more than intent. Um, with this, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you Sorry, very much. Sorry, I can't read numbers this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. John. Mr. Morinaga? Good morning. Um, I have a written statement from uh, our company. Uh, I'm the managing director of PHR Ken Marconija, the local affiliate of Ken Corporation of Japan. I'll, I'll read the statement that I forwarded to Senator Rodriguez. I write in a strong support of Bill 416-32, which would create a special hotel qualifying certificate for hotel owners and developers. Bill 416-32 encourages and allows the growth of the hotel industry by helping interested hotel owners and new developers achieve the Vision 2020 objective to the build 1,600 new hotel rooms by 2020, making Guam a more attractive destination for regional and international tourists. As a managing director, I recognize and appreciate the importance of maximizing the revenue that is generated from tourists that travel to Guam. PHR and its affiliates on Guam own and operate a number of well-known hotel brands and resort properties on Guam, including Sheraton Laguna Guam Resort, Hilton Guam Resort and Spa, Pacific Island Club, and the Country Club of the Pacific, among others. As hotel owners and operated, PHR subsidiaries are familiar with the subs consistent demand for and sometimes seasonal shortage of hotel accommodation for Guam tourists. Hotel owners like PHR undoubtedly desire to expand and upgrade their existing amenities or construct new facilities to respond to this demand and attract additional tourists. However, given the vitality of the tourism market, hotels like PHR must weigh the potential benefit of undertaking the cost of new hotel construction and or renovation against the potential risk that tourist arrivals may decrease due to economics, natural disasters, or change in immigration policies. Bill 416, that 32 reduces this risk significantly by providing economic incentive to hotel owners and developers like us. The introduction of the Hotel QC signifies the Gu government of Guam commitment to support this valuable industry. The tax rebate, exemption, and abatement contemplated by the Bill 416-32 are unique economic incentives that alleviate commercial stresses during the period following major renovation or construction that may delay the opening and full-scale operation of hotel properties. Guam desperately needs additional hotel rooms and renovated hotel facilities in order to attract more visitors to our island. An increase in the number of such visitors result in increased investment in our economy, new jobs, opportunity for local residents, and the overall growth of our tourist industry. Thus, the limited term benefit to hotel development holding a hotel QC produces long term benefit to our island and our economy. I thank you for introducing Bill 41632, which will give our island's most profitable industry as much needed boost so that it may continue to be competitive with other attractive tourist destinations in this region. I respectfully urge the Guam legislature to pass this bill, important bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mr. Carp, uh, Mr. John Senecalis, do you have a, t a testimony? If not, okay, we'll save you for the questions, if any. Uh, Mr. Carl Pangilinan. Off day, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and good morning. Um, before I start my testimony, I just want to share I'm just hours fresh from returning from Korea, so it's only fitting that I say uh, congratulations to all three of you. I uh, look forward to another couple of years of working together on uh, progress for Guam. Um, off day again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Sadus Masi, and thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony um, relative to Bill 416-32. Uh, the Guam Visitors Bureau supports the bill except for the section that opposes the abeyance of the qualifying certificate QC program. The QC program has been and continues to be an important tool for attracting new investment to Guam and developing new industries. Guam's visitor industry 
is the program's greatest success story, with tourism generating over 20,000 jobs and more than $150 million in tax revenues annually. After working extensively with tourism and community stakeholders, including the legislature, GVB was pleased to launch the Tourism 2020 Strategic Plan in January of this year. The plan sets for the road sets for the roadmap for achieving the shared vision for destination Guam, a first class, a world class first tier resort destination of choice, offering a U.S. island paradise with stunning ocean vistas for two million business and leisure visitors from across the region, with accommodations and activities ranging from value to five star luxury all in a safe, clean, family-friendly environment set amidst a unique 4,000-year-old culture. The, the plan projects an aggressive yet achievable goal of 1.75 to 2 million visitor arrivals by the year 2020, adding approximately 12,000 more jobs and 140 million in additional tax revenues. However, the limiting factor to reaching these goals is our current lack of hotel room in inventory, and Tourism 2020 reveals that 1,600 more rooms are needed to grow our visitor arrivals. We appreciate GIDA's board, management, and staff for recognizing this opportunity and updating the QC program to effectively attract new hotel investment. Asia's tourism industry is booming, and the cost of doing business on Guam is quite high relative to many parts of Asia. This new QC program is exactly the tool Guam needs to be competitive in this environment, and GVB looks forward to marketing this program together with GIDA. Once again, Stuus Masi, and for allowing me to submit this testimony on behalf of GVB. Thank you very much, Mr. Pangilinan. I think we're all on the same page here on the um, on the incentive for the 1,600 rooms. Um, but I know just in your testimony as well, I think we got to get on the same page on the provision that um, calls for the abeyance. And again, this is not a um, a permanent stop to any QC. This is this is a temporary uh, um, pause, a, 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 you know, pause, really giving Gita the um, the opportunity to come up with. Uh, a measurable formula, just like we've done here with the uh, uh, QC for hotel rooms, and so, and even you know, we even um, you know put a date here when Gita should be able to transmit this, uh, to, you know, to the legislature. I know that time is fast approaching, and it's not it doesn't just what we've seen working with David um, doesn't take um, overnight to to come up with um, with a program. But now that we we may have a, a template, you know, there's this, this can be used as a guide. Um, for the other industries, so I just want to um, maybe give Gita the opportunity to to um, to respond that knowing that this is not a um, a permanent um, stop to the QC program, but this is something that is giving you the opportunity. What is the vision? You know, what is the vision for our island um, down the road, and how can we incorporate that vision now with a new incentive that will bring in investors here? I know what we've seen here now is that we have a, a QC program that is really open ended. Uh, you have industries that say, okay, industry one through, I don't know how many we have now, one through 10 is uh, approved for QCs. And then you have for specific industries, you have um, that it says in law that you must, um, you know, abate 100% of um, income taxes, 100% of, um, of um, corporate um, taxes. And so those are the things we want to avoid because we want to make sure that it's it's tied into what investment is, is, is made and what contributions um, are made to the community. And that's what this bill for the, at least for the, the 1600 room is doing. And that's what we, that's all we want to do is, is not give away the, the much needed revenue that our community um, needs, um, but we want to make it a win-win. And so how long would it take for, for Gita to um, be able to put, um, you know, looking at the vision, you know, you have there, there's a 2020 vision 2020 on tourism. Um, but looking at the other industries, how long would it take Gita to come up with? Um, you know, the, re uh, the, the, the I think we're on the same page again is mm -hmm. the, you know, the idea behind having the industry specific is each industry has different needs and benefits to the community. So we tie them all together. What was a couple reasons why we went with the hotel one first was one, it was pressing, it, it was, you know, obviously needed. Uh, and it was there. And the second one was that we had Tourism Vision 2020 uh, behind it, which created the clarity of it. Uh, where we go to the next one is there's, there's no clarity really to what's needed with the community outside 2020. So it's, you know, we're going to go talk, talk about services next. I think it's what's next on the plate. Uh, but there's no pressing thing that's out there with the clarity of it. So I don't think it takes that th that long of time. You know, you're talking months, not years. Uh, but, you know, it would take a few months to get that one put together, then a few months to put the next one together. The, the obeyance word is just is really where it comes down to. I think we're in, our intent is on the same page, is that we all want to make sure that we're 
designing programs that are beneficial to the community. We're not just giving Treasury's money away. That's something I'm, I, mean, I know I'm very much convi uh, uh, have a high conviction of. It's not something we should just be giving it away. We should be able to define why are we doing this, how much are we giving up, that it gets that we have timelines on things and that we follow a structure. So I think the structure is good. We wanted to bring it to you first, make sure that your 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 the legislature agrees with the structure, and then rolling out the next one should be much more timely. Uh, but the word abeyance is the, is the key. It just it just sends a negative wording. Uh, so if it could be changed to that as we're developing this, that to make sure that this is a is a team effort. That if we have a QC opportunity that doesn't fall neatly into one of these Q specific industry QCs, that we'll bring it to you and let you know what we're up to and you know what what we're trying to accomplish with this, and give you an opportunity to say no, that's not what we're you know not where we're going with this, or yes, that's where we're going with this, and then we can build it into a QC, you know, industry specific if it's something that would carry forward. Which kind of brings up one more thing is along the way there's going to be QCs that really just don't fit into anything. And I think you know if, if it doesn't fit into one of the one of the industry specific QCs, this could be three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, to make sure there's a community buy-in on it. I think that it it does make sense to have the process looked at from the different branches of government. Uh, some people, that's my personal opinion. That's not Gita's opinion. Uh, but by having that open there, that if it doesn't fall in one of these specific QCs, that it comes to the legislative process. I think that creates the community buy-in that's needed for something like this. Again, my, it's my personal opinion, not the, the board's opinion. Thank you very much. And, and, and if just, I could add, yes. Senator, I'm sorry, um, you know, putting this abeyance, uh, putting it into effect would, would really put us in a difficult situation. We recently had uh, the Guam Economic Symposium where we touched on a number of different industries and spoke to a number of different investors in those industries. And there is an enormous interest in, in coming to Guam and expanding some of the industries that we've been looking to expand, such as agriculture and so on. So uh, to put an all-out abeyance on any future QCs would give us a difficult time, especially since those were some of the marketing. That was the only marketing tool that we offered. Um, and, and recognizing that the, the GITA board is very... Um, uh, focused on making sure that we look out for the best interests of the community. Our board will weigh um, all of the, the community benefits that are offered. And, you know, as, as the director had mentioned, you know, if it is the, the desire of the legislature, we would definitely come back to you and discuss these things before we move forward. But to put forward, uh, to allow for the abeyance, that would really put us in a bind. So I, I'm glad that you mentioned that um, the, the recently concluded um, what is it, the uh, the Income. summit or the... Um, the Invest Guam, the Invest uh, Guam, Guam Economic Development right. uh, so, or Guam Economic Symposium. Yeah, so, so Gita already has idea, you know, has idea. What are these um, uh, industries that maybe um, that Gita would like to pursue and based on your, on companies that maybe have come here and expressed that? So I don't think it, it's it's going to be hard, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, for Gita now to, to, to come to the table with, you know, with you guys, same thing you've done with this, and say, okay, this is an industry that... Um, we want to pursue uh, this is an industry that we we get we we've got investors willing to come here and put and put a package together and say okay what is what is Guam's need on 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 agriculture what can we do to entice these investors to really make that commitment to Guam so that's the, that's that's what this provision is 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 requiring right and and you know they, I think Dave and I are on the same page on this and and, and you know I'm I'm willing to make these amendments um, to um, to perhaps fine tune the language but I think uh, what we really need to have is have a structure a structure in place that says uh, moving forward these are the industries that Guam need this this is what we need not something that what we have today where we just if we thought about an industry put it on the list. You know, uh, but so that's what we're doing. It's not we're not closing up shop. We're not closed for business. Yeah, Gita is still, um, you know, the forefront on this. And what we're doing is giving you that opportunity now, knowing what are these uh, industries that we need to develop and what industries now that people uh, may have some interest in Guam. Just one, one point out on that. It's, I think we're so close on this. It, it's we're just thinning, you know, uh, cutting hairs or, hmm. or splicing hairs. But I just would hate to see the headline in the paper tomorrow that Guam is passing an abeyance on QCs. When in reality, what we're trying to do here is just set the process in place and making sure that we have community buy-in each thing that we're doing. I mean, I think we're all in agreement, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we're in agreement that we want to just step back on each of these, write up QCs that are industry-specific and relevant, 
and then getting total community buy-in. And it's we're not really a, a, we're not really terminating QCs, and we're not really stopping the program. So, but just using that one word, I can just see the headline, and I don't want to see that. So, I mean, if we can just change that wording to that in, as we're developing these, and if something doesn't fall within one of these, that we will bring it to the legislature for the discussion to make sure that we have community buy-in. I mean, that's that's just sure coming down the middle with it. I think it's tweaking it, but I think we'd all kind of be on the same page of support. Okay. Sure. And so what we'll work, we'll continue to work with you. We, I intend to get this on our, our session as well, our last session for the term. Um, so we'll work on you and I'm sure we can find um, um, some language that uh, would, would satisfy all the concerns here. Mr. Panglinen? Yeah, if I, if I just may add, um, Mr. Chairman, it's been very hard for me. I've been almost two years at GVB, but it's been very hard for me to take my Gita hat off. Uh, I do position Guam on a daily basis as a visitor destination, but every uh, every chance we get, we also, um, you know, try to play the, the investment card and, and you know, uh, pitching Guam as an investment destination. There's just a couple of things, and it does seem like we're not too far off. Um, I mean, it could just be a word or two that makes all the difference in the world. Um, what I do want to point out is... Um, I think the, the section with the general industry specific abeyance also contemplates no renewals. And I don't know what's in the hopper right now with Gita in, in the amount of QCs that they are entertaining, but even the renewal process I know is a process and it, and it does take some time. Um, and I think, you know, uh, um, if, if you just look in the past almost four years, there have only been two QCs that were issued. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that process is a lengthy process. Um, I don't see if we can include some language in there that it, it runs concurrent. Uh, again, I don't know what's in the hopper, but I, I am very confident uh, once a QC is established that the um, compliance uh, department at GITA is very on point in terms of uh, uh, you know ensuring that each company is compliant with their QCs. Um, the other thing is just uh, the, the headlines. I mean, uh, David John mentioned it before, uh, and it wasn't until he started to get as well as myself. You know, a lot of what gets the headlines is what gets abated and what gets rebated, and, and just the, the opportunity lost with the tax revenues. What doesn't get enough uh, attention really are the benefits that the island does receive um, from uh, an investment, uh, such as a hotel, the number of jobs. They are required also to contribute back to the community uh, almost a proportionate amount. And, and so, you know, D David John hit it on the, on the head with... Um, <coughs> I think some of the things that aren't finite in the current QC program, uh, because there are variable, um, you know, variable uh, tax rebates. It's dependent on the amount of um, income, you know, that uh, that uh, one company gets, for uh, for instance, and that could vary from company to company. And you know, we just have to uh, assume that a company with healthy income is going to be a healthy company that will contribute back to the island, um, and and that's the only things that I would want to point out is just really to stress the benefits that uh, that the QC does receive. Sure, there are, um, you know, tax rebates on, on one end, but I think the benefits really far outweigh the, uh, the, the rebates and abatements that companies are receiving. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that just to touch up a little bit, we, we looked at what um, was what's, what's in the hopper for Renew. I don't think there's anything um, next year. I think it's 2016 is when... From, if, I, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? But but that see that that even there is a starter, it is a starter, and where Gita can say, okay, this is what's coming down, this is what's down the line in terms of renewal, and start from there, and look at what industry these um, QCs are, are 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 in, and start from there in developing what the criteria is moving forward. So, okay, we'll we'll we'll, we'll touch on that and make sure that we have a, a language that is um, going to be acceptable, and not something that would um, necessarily say that uh, Gita our QC programs club because it's not yeah and just okay. to, to point out what carl said we're not qc happy we've we've had, we've sure. passed two qcs since we've 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 our, our current board's been together and you know one of them was the uh uh hydroponic farm which i think was a no-brainer and the other was the hospital which i know there's been public debate on but we went through that you know uh very extensively so we have we're not out doing these every day that's for certain sure and i think this has this particular provision has come from an oversight uh, hearing we had with Gita on um, the QC program and uh, you know one that we can share with the the insurance industry that's something that has a really big concern from the community and so we we, we don't we, we want to address it and I think addressing it this is one way of addressing it is ensuring that moving forward we look at the industries and see and be very clear and have a have a formula that we can measure the um, you know what we're given out and what investments are coming in okay uh, mr. vice chairman uh, Mr. Senator again. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. David John, just a quick question. I, if, correct me if I'm mistaken, but one of the comments that you initially opened up with was we're not able to quantify the tax benefits that is uh, being given to some of our businesses. Is that correct? Yeah, because for, I so, understand yeah. the benefits about employment and yeah. about uh, individual. Yeah, so for example, if, 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 a, if a bill stated that the, the current structure, 75% yes. of income tax for 20 years, well, what is that? One of the things, you know, when I heard, when I constantly hear is, oh, the, ho the hotels are, are, are taking it from the community. But if, you know, if you looked at that, what the initial QCs that were given to the hotels was 10 years of property tax, right. and 75% of income tax, and there's the dividend exclusion, but there's no local investors really. I mean, there's a couple, but, so really you're looking at two, the property tax and the income tax. But those, when you're looking at the hotel industry, um, hotels really don't start making income from an income tax perspective to like year eight, right? Because of the yeah, depreciation and such. So you're looking at the, the, the benefit after that, and it's all subjective. We don't know what it's gonna be because we don't know how much income is gonna be derived. So the community thinks we're giving up this, when in reality we're probably giving up this, and no one can say, but I can't argue it. Someone could say that, that the, the current Q, QC is gonna give up $200 million of taxes. You can't really say no because you don't know what the company is going to make an income tax, right? So we don't know how much income tax we're giving up. But this new QC sets it straight up, 10%. That's right. the max, right? So that it's that we've quantified the dollar amount and the percentage amount straight mm -hmm. up front, and that's one of the important things with it. Yeah, I think I think that's a, the second half of the coin, so to speak, in yeah. terms of trying to justify the qualifying certificate program. It's looking at the benefits ultimately in terms of employment, in terms of our people, the loc our local residents being able to avail themselves of management positions, yeah. and some of the other provisions and requirements within the qualifying certificate. We know that side of the coin, yeah. but the other side of the coin is really what are the people of Guam or what has the community of Guam given up in terms of potential revenues exactly. that would otherwise be coming to the community. Yeah, and that so was really cognitive of it. So when we're looking at it, first is what's the benefit to the community, and second, what are we giving up? And then, now, we, then we design it. On that note, yeah. would this law identify and quantify that figure? Yes, 9.5% total. I mean, 10%, and then they have to give a half percent back in community, right? So the total amount of benefit that could, that could be given if the project is a, su a success is nine and a half percent. If the project's not a success, it'll be less than that. Okay. But it'll never go above that. And that's the key to this whole thing. We can quantify it now. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and I think that that's excellent in terms of looking at, at making sure that the people of Guam understand both sides, the benefits and yeah. what we're foregoing in terms of potential tax revenues. Yeah, and then we can you have know, the discussion, what's the right amount? You know, yeah. is it nine and a half? You know, there's people that want it more than that. You know, there's people that are asking for 20%. So, I mean, it's just, what, what's the amount that makes sense? Well, we certainly have to be uh, extremely re reasonable yep. on behalf of the people of Guam, understanding that the market conditions and the economic conditions may avail themselves to entice businesses to come to Guam. And just look at Guam regardless as to whether any tax benefits are going to be given to them, and then start negotiating that. And that will so, help us just set the right m mentality when we look at these things going forward, because they're special. You know, we're calling them special QCs, but they have time limits on it. But we may need something in advance in a different industry, and it's, we, it's just really pressing that we have a certain amount and a certain time limit so that we come up with a, a super you know a super QC for a, this period of time to help the community through and then it's done but we yeah. can use those as tools to incentivize people to move on our timeline not their timeline and that's why we put the 1600 rooms and the China visa in places if you're thinking about this and you're thinking about coming for the China visa yeah. we're gonna give you this incentive to make your move now as opposed to after the fact and here's the dollar amount or here's the percentage amount so it's just define it and you know we can then we can argue what's the definition and what's the right definition and not be out there arguing things that you know are unknowns so we, we tried to create as many knowns as possible when we mm -hmm. put it together I think you, you highlighted one of the potential economic uh, drivers down the road is the China visa waiver and then obviously the military buildup. Once that record of decision, uh, should it be rendered in, in favor of moving completely forward uh, in spite of the NDAA's actions of the, the House and the Senate, the conference committee. I mean, that's, that bodes extremely well for the entire process, but knowing full well that, okay, we have the anticipated military buildup, and then we have this program, which is pushing for 1,600 additional rooms for visitors. So we've got not only the visitor industry, but we also have the military community um, increasing in potential economic opportunities for businesses out there. So my question then, my follow-up question, and this is in line with what the chairman anticipates doing 
in terms of being a little bit more specific and defining the parameters of the benefits down the road. Uh, I mean, we keep using the word abeyance. I would consider a temporary suspension or, or whatever the case may be until such time that the parameters are set. But looking at what you have in this legislation, why would we not want to go to the general provision of tax benefits and perhaps look at modifying that? Because this, did, this yeah. would give us both sides of yeah, the Yeah, we, we thought about that too. I mean, if you want to go that route, we could, we, could, we could go that route. But the idea of being industry specific is we didn't want to give away the boat if we didn't have to, right? And so we wanted to look at each industry and figure out what's, what's the real incentive that's going to bring someone here. And so that we would have to, we would, we'd basically be forced to go through the process with each industry and be specific about it. As, a price to, as opposed to trying to come in with this broad brush and for, you know, for, for example, What's in, what, what is a, a hotel going to bring to the community as opposed to a, a service industry? And then what should the community be asking for in exchange? You know, the service industry, for example, we want to make sure this many jobs are, are here and this, it's, more of a, it's more of a soft dollar event, mm -hmm. right? And then a hotel is a hard dollar event. We want to make sure the hotel is there with X number of rooms. That's going to be the generator. So the idea was, was the reason we broke this up wasn't to make it complex, it was actually to simplify it. I know you're going to have a series of them there, right? But when, when a, an investor would come in, we could pull off the, off the shelf the, the one that was specific to their industry, and it would, be more, it would be more in line with what they're looking for and what the community is willing to give up, as opposed to trying to, to take something on this broad stretch as we keep adding things to it, and then it crosses over, and we don't right. how is this going to affect this industry and that one? I mean, I, we can go that way, but okay. we just thought it was just easier, you know, uh, no, keep it No, it's simple. fine. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is specific but that's, to... That's the lot. We went through that, yeah. just so you know, we went through that discussion in nauseam. Actually, I think the first four, <laughs> four or five meetings was only on that, because uh -huh. there was people that were against it and people that were for it, and then we kind of shaped it up and came to the idea that I think we're talking about kind of the, this obeying thing. We were talking about the same things, but we were just were kind of coming at it from different angles to try yeah. to get there. And yeah, so the, the only, only reason we separated wasn't to make it complicated, it was actually just simplify. The issue I have, I guess, in regards to this is now we would have two different uh, proposals that would be available for businesses that would like to pursue investments in Guam. One would be the general proposal, which the chairman is moving in the direction of trying to redefine. And then we have this specifically for 600, 1,600 hotels. But then what if there are complementary businesses within this industry that would like to invest significant dollars in Guam and it doesn't fall under this category, so they would obviously fall under the, the redefined pr perspective. But I understand, and this, this discussion can go infinitum in terms of looking at, at how and, and where this legislation should be incorporated, because obviously if you want to look at this as just hotel-specific 600 rooms, then we can move in this direction and then look at some of the other specific industries out there so that we can uh, cater some of the qualifying certificate benefits to these businesses. I guess the final comment I want to close with, Mr. Chairman, is I really appreciate the, the sense of respect that you have for this August body in terms of visiting other qualifying certificate, perhaps applications that do not fall into the realm of what's existing in the books, in the law. But um, I think that, to me at least, from my perspective, uh, you are all the subject matter experts. You look at the numbers, you look at the potential, you look at the industry, you look at the needs, you look at the desires of this community. And really, those decisions, aside from us amending the law that says this particular industry should be included in there, or this particular service should be included in the qualifying certificate, after you set the parameters, I really feel very strongly that that information and that decision ultimately should rest on GITA. Because you look at the full spectrum of everything, when when you send something down here, we may want to look at, at everything, but in the same token, the reality is, is we want to promote economic development. And if this is good, and, and Gita and the board says it's good, the community of Guam says it's good, then bringing it to the legislative body, is, I understand the respect and allowing us to be able to review it, but our job should be policy. Okay. Yeah, I, I concur, actually, yeah. exactly. The only reason I was throwing that out there was just to make sure that you, it, it it holds us responsible to go out and get these other ones done, that we're not just going to come up with this one and say, oh, we right. got the one we wanted, let's stop this process. We wanted to make sure that, there was, that, we, that we were held responsible to make sure we got these other ones set up. We just thought in the meantime that would maybe give you 
what you're looking for. As long as the policy and the yeah. authorization is set in law from this body, then obviously you carry out uh, the decisions and ultimately look at how it's going to benefit our community. And, and the other co side of the coin is how the people of Guam are also investing because they, this business may be investing in Guam, providing jobs for our people, uh, building facilities, but what's the people of Guam's investment in return? And that's foregoing ta income tax dollars, foregoing property tax dollars. So it's really a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship that we need to continue to foster, but to a great extent. It goes back to what I was just sharing with you. Uh, really, the Gita board is, emp is empowered to make those decisions. So we, I would lean in that direction and work with the chairman in terms of how perhaps we can identify specific industries out there that could possibly be added to the law for that authorization. So aside from that, uh, certainly this legislation, I look forward to it being reported out and discussing it on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator. Again, again, thank you very much. Is there any other comments or anything else um, you wish to uh, discuss? If not, I want to thank you for uh, for being here. But thank also uh, Mr. David, John, and Gita representatives for putting uh, working together with the committee and putting this together. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to start with <laughs> Can you say that again, Carl? Can you say that? I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I'm sorry, we still have one um, individual. Okay, if Gita, if, can I ask Gita to please uh, remain um, in, in the room? Uh, we have one more individual that wishes to um, uh, provide testimony on this bill, uh, Ms. Amanda Young. Hi. Please, yes, please, ma'am. Just um, um, state your name and who you represent for the record. Can you turn it on, make sure the red light is on? Hello, so my name is Amanda Young. Um, I'm a, I, I guess you would say, a, a local industry investor to Guam. I probably don't look at it from here, but I am a pres I'm the president of Pacific Composites, Inc. We're actually the legislature's neighbor. Uh, the boats that you see right next to you guys, we recently expanded our business from a on-call, on-site, uh, working from our home, working on the tourist boats. My husband has grown up in the boating industry. He's actually sailed around the world and um, attributed a lot of his knowledge from growing up in the marine industry and learning how to build boats and his dad being a contractor. We started off with uh, being on call on site because it was the easiest for us to uh, accommodate the tourist boats and repair them and make it so they pass inspections. Uh, so that way they can go back out there and, you know, bring the tourists out to see our beautiful island and our and the, the ocean and everything. And uh, recently we expanded because we had gotten lots of feedback from uh, private industry, so uh, local boating enthusiasts who would like us to expand our services to help them. And it took a big... <laughs> A big risk to make that decision to expand because expansion also means debts, big debts. So it was it was fine for us being at home, knowing that we'd have a few months uh, out of work. We'd just save up for it, you know. And then when another job came, it would be a feast. And then we knew the famine would come, and we'd just save up for it. So uh, we we were comfortable with that for a long time, but we wanted to uh, answer the call of the public who wanted us to provide our skills and our services to be broader. With that, um, an off-island investor came to us, liking our values, liking who we are, what we represent, the family aspect of uh, being a business who decided to go in corporate. And Suzuki Motors came up to us personally, knowing that we didn't have a showroom, didn't have anything, but because they loved what we represented, um, which I think is what a lot of our island community does. We, we have a character, a flavor that brings more than just uh, investing in tourism. It's uh, uh, what we value. And uh, so they came to us as a foreign investor to bring in Suzuki Motors to Guam. And so that meant also getting another expansion to be able to accommodate a facility to do wholesale and retail. So with that, it meant more debt. 
and along with the debt, we had taxes on top of it. And I can say month to month we struggled to uh, 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 meet the expansion uh, payables that we do and also bringing in more employees, which was great to be able to you know, offer more jobs to, to Guam by doing that. But also in that expansion, we had uh, a big dream to be offer more than that, to offer local manufacturing, to invest in Guam and a step further in building boats locally. Because in the in expansion, we've found that we've had a lot of uh, customers say that it costs them lots of money to bring a boat to Guam. They actually have to ship it here. It's very expensive. So there's only two options really to have boats here is either to ship it, and that's even for tourism, you know, for the, the charter boats. They, they actually ship them here or have someone captain them and sail them here, or they find a, a dilapidated old boat that they will have us redo. But sometimes somebody just wants a new boat that they don't have to worry about, that they go, can go out there and start their business with, whether it's private charter or if it's for tourism. And we wanted to bring... Uh, the aspect of having locally made boats, um, having it so that way we can have a um, innovative facility to accommodate that, and also possibly one day making it to where we can have um, mariner time schooling with you know building boats, showing people how to do it. We've wanted to do workshops for people so they can build it the right way, safely, e efficiently, effectively. And then having that be an export to the uh, local and the, uh, also outlying islands around us. So that way they can have safe boats for them, for their families, for their industries, and having Guam be, um, you know, expanded to be an export that way. But that's a dream that having many payables, many debts, every month, you know, I struggle with her to keep going with it, to, to do the dream, to follow a bigger value over money, and uh, having something mean more than just, you know, um, how good it looks on paper and numbers, but what it means personally to people, what it can offer as far as jobs and opportunities, and the market leaves for saying that um, they're a possible maritime academy, some, you know, things like that that could happen, but the biggest thing that um, trumps that is is money. And um, I can honestly say the only reason why I know to come here today is um, by chance I contacted Gita and they told me about this and they said possibly the QC for this bill could, could help with that. And I can see that they're trying to define the industries to include in this. And so I can't say whether I'm for or against because I understand holding um, an agency to defining parameters for something. But I'd also like it to happen as fast as possible so we can, so we can get help to, to live out a dream on Guam and, and, and be more than, uh, than worry more about just you know, finances and, and worry more about you know, what more we can offer. So thank you for listening in to my, my personal testimony and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Young, for your uh, for, te for your testimony for coming down this this morning. Um, you would uh, um, that would be classified as a service, right? Is it service or we, manufacturing? Okay, yes, and that's we do uh, we do quite a bit service manufacturing and uh, supply to other other companies out here. That's right, and yeah. so that falls now within the the two uh, industries that uh, currently. Um, are granted uh, QCs, and so um, you know I would suggest that you continue to work with them because these uh, individuals are are, are the professional, and they're very good in working with um, with entrepreneurs um, such as yourself. And so uh, what we're what we're trying to do now is that as we have discussed earlier, is define the parameters. Like you have a service industry or manufacturing, is define the parameters and make it easier uh, for for investors like you to be able to say, okay, this is how much if I invest this much money, this is how much in taxes that I can be abated. And this is what my responsibility is, is are as, a, as an investor that is going to be, 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 be given these, um, these abatements. And so um, 
just like you said, um, you, you would like them to, if we move forward with that, um, you know, with that direction, that it be done as soon as possible. That's why this bill called for them to be able to provide us these new parameters by January 30th. That, you know, that might be, um, you know, too ambitious of, of a time frame because, you know, these are different industries, right? right. But I know that uh, Mr. John, who's a board member, and he, I believe he chairs the, um, he's a vice chair on the board, but chairs the, this committee that looks at QCs, has indicated to me that the next um, item that they're going to be working on is the service, the service industry. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure, and we'll, and we'll make sure when we come up with a final bill that, um, that you know, nothing is, is um, that nothing is there in the bill or the law that would stop, you know, any, um, um, you know, any development of new industries or industries now that need the additional help. We want to make sure we, we, we continue with the abeyance portion. We just, we still have a language there that'll make sure that investors like you won't be, you know, won't be... Um, um, overlooked, right? Yeah, overlooked. Yeah. And that this is something you want to do now. We want to make sure that that um, opportunity is still there for you because just like you'll, it'll benefit our, our community as well. So again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your, um, your trust and confidence in our community. And we look forward to um, working closely with you. Thank you well. very much. Senator Elkin, do you have anything? Question, Ms. Young. Thank you for your testimony this morning. But have you submitted your application for QC? Um, I put in. Um, I don't know if it's an application. I did fill out a letter. I think it's a letter of intent. It's letter of okay, intent. Okay. So is that okay. a part of it? So because, I've, I've because already. Because I mean, even in, in that particular case, if, if perhaps we can grandfather any any submitted application slash letter of intent, so that it, the abeyance component does not affect people like yourself, then at least you would be able to continue and proceed with your application because under the manufacturing component, you would already be eligible. So uh, the chairman would consider that in this legislation that any letter of intent or make sure we get the, the correct verbiage, Kita representatives, please, and so that it does not affect your opportunity to be able to avail yourself of existing benefits that are given to hotels and other other industry players, and then we can proceed with perhaps redefining some of the parameters of, of the other sectors. So I just want to make sure that, oh, like that's you said, good to you're know. Not, yes, you're not thank left you. Out of thank you. Especially you're looking, you're continuing to employ our people. You're looking at at expanding your business so that in fact you can provide a, an added tourism related slash islandy uh, component. It, it covers a lot, and yes. it's it's very exciting to know that you know my company can offer something that's very, you know broad for uh, several industries, you know, and okay. local. Thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll now move on to the next item of the agenda, um, Bill 422. I'd like to now call on um, Mr. Leo Casil, Deputy Director of the Department of Public Health, Ms. Mr. Ambrose um, Constantino, um, Department of Homeland Security, and also um, anyone else uh, from Public Health and Homeland uh, that would like to come forward, Ms. Lucy, please, if you, if you, do you have anyone else? Um, <coughs> Thank you very much um, for, for being here. Thank you very much for patiently waiting. I uh, apologize for that. Um, Bill 422 is an act to provide for isolation and quarantine procedures relative to the emergency detention order for the incubation periods of severe communicable diseases as determined by the U.S. Center for Disease Control by amending um, several sections um, in Chapter 10 of Guam Code annotated. And also it um, authorizes the, the sum of 130000 for related purposes. Uh, what this bill is, as the main sponsor, um, is to provide the tools necessary to our um, uh, our first responders here um, in dealing with any um, communicable disease threat to our community. Uh, last term, we worked very closely, Public Health, Ms. Josie O'Malley specifically, um, to um, provide a um, isolation and quarantine procedures and what we need to do moving forward if there is indeed any threat to our community. Um, fortunately, we have never tested uh, that law. We've never needed to test that law. Uh, but now seeing what has, um, you know, what is happening um, worldwide, uh, we want to make sure that our community remains protected and that uh, working with, um, with public health, homeland security, uh, we've come up with um, this bill that would um, provide them the, um, the, the tools necessary to, to do just that, which is protect our community. This um, bill also provides for um, a small amount of, um, 
of funds that are being appropriated at the governor's um, discretion to use of what is um, available within the executive branch to, for the purchase of um, PPEs, uh, which are known as protective, personal protective equipment. Um, understand that I don't believe we we do have, and correct me if I'm wrong later, that we do have any of these um, equipment on island, uh, but this, this dollar amount has also come um, uh, in consultation with Homeland Security um, in knowing what um, these costs are, what, it, what may be needed in, in the event of any uh, threat to our community. So I'll go ahead and start off with um, public health. Uh, Mr. Casil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it should be good to be last because you know, I get comfortable when uh, not too many people listening. <laughs> oh, too loud? Okay. Um, unlike Mr. Penglina, I like Mr. Penglina, I'd like to also congratulate you on, on your election and also for being the top two vote getters, uh, the senators. Uh, good faith, guys. And we, we really look forward in, in working with you as, as we usually do. So, on, on behalf of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, uh, I'm here with my team. And the team also includes Homeland Security, which will be involved. And uh, to start with, I'd like to read a written testimony from our director. And I think you have a copy. Uh, and, and after that, we will be available for questions. And in, in, if we have time to also, if, if you uh, like, we'll, we'll be willing to, to also uh, provide you with some info on what we've done to help keep you abreast of what's been happening. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Senator Hagan. So on, on behalf of our, our director, Mr. Gillen, I'd, I'd like to read his letter. Uh, half a day, Mr. Chairman and members of the Committee on Health and Human Services, Senior Citizens. Oh, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm Leo Casil, <laughs> Deputy Director from Public Health and Social Services on behalf of our director. Uh, my name, is, uh, in, in regards to Mr. James, uh, d uh, Director of Public Health, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide testimony in support on Bill 422-32, an act to provide for isolation and quarantine procedures relative to an emergency detention order for the accommodation period of severe chemical disease as determined by the U.S. Center for Disease Control by amending sections three and four of the isolation and quarantine regulations and, and, uh, and to authorize the sum of 130,000 for late purposes. On August 8th, the World Health organization declared the current Ebola outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. The 2014 Ebola epidemics is the largest in history with widespread transmission in multiple countries in West Africa. As of November 28th, a total of 15,901 Ebola cases were reported with 5,674 deaths. To date, two imported cases including one death and two locally acquired cases in healthcare workers have been reported in the United States. There is no report cases of Ebola on Guam. The Ebola virus is not spread by casual contact through air or by water or by any food grown or legally purchased in the United States. The virus is spread through direct contact with the body fluids of a person who is sick with or has died from Ebola, blood, vomit, urine, feces, semen, spit. Ebola can only be spread to other after symptoms begin. Symptoms, such as fever, headaches, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach muscle pain, unexplained bleeding can appear from two to 21 days after exposure, and this is called the incubation period. The incubation period of communicable disease is defined as the length of time between entry of an infectious agent into the body and the beginning of disease symptoms. Bill 422-32 amends the current isolation and quarantine regulations to extend the period of isolation and quarantine with or without consent based on the conviction period of any communal disease, including Ebola, beyond the 10 days. This we support um, very, very well. In addition, we are also in support of adding a, a subsection 4502 and amending 4505 of Chapter 4A, 10 GCA, giving authority to the director of, regarding the final disposition of human remains based on CDC guidance to ensure the safe handling of human remains that may contain a chemical disease such as Ebola. We support the initial funding authorization of 130,000 to the Department of Public Health and Social Services to be expended as this designated in Section 10 for bio-infectious personal protection equipment and supplies. Of course, 
a distribution and allocation plan will be established to prioritize the expenditures and who the appropriate entities will be for the initial setup. And as you indicated, it's a, it's a small amount, but at least it's a good start at this point. And uh, we will set up the, the, the uh, priority plan to, to, for, for the uh, individual entities or, or programs to who will be receiving uh, uh, the, these PPEs and supplies as indicated. And, and lastly, I, I know we've, we've found a, uh, just a minor correction that uh, our staff has uh, found. Uh, uh, Ms. O'Malley here says, we request that the citation of U.S. Center for Disease Control be corrected to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the term pandemic removed in Section 4, the um, parenthesis C, to ensure that all communicable disease not classified as a pandemic epidemic occurring on a scale which crosses international boundaries, usually affecting a large number of, of people, are covered. So in conclusion, we recommend approval of Bill 42232 and thank you for your consideration and support. And for any other further questions, you may contact the Division of Public Health Bureau of Communicable Disease Control of this department at 735-7142. And again, I'd like to thank you and um, uh, we'll be ready for, for any uh, questions that you may have re regarding the bill and any other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Casillo. Mr. Constantino? First off, uh, congratulations on your re-election and uh, hope to continue uh, the relationship we've had uh, with both of you. It was, uh, it was great uh, working with you guys. Um, I would like to summarize my, my, te my written testimony. Uh, first off, Guam Homeland Security Office of Civil Defense is in favor of Bill 422-32 for the following reasons. Um, first off, Guam, um, Guam law does allow uh, quarantine uh, isolation, but it's limited to 10 days. Um, and so with your bill, uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, let's say, Ebola, uh, it's over 10 days. In fact, it's 21 days per CDC, civil, uh, Centers for Disease Control. If it requires more than uh, 10 days, then what happens is we have to go through a legal process of going to the courts, and that could be a delay or a possibility in the gap where that person may go back into society, and then through court order, we have to bring them back in. So th your bill will assist uh, public health uh, in that form. And then lastly, uh, the $130,000, uh, it's actually a very good start if an emergency was to occur or if there are signs of an emergency that may come. Uh, for example, if there's Ebola in other places such as Hawaii or uh, Korea, the Philippines, and so on and so forth, any place where there's a direct flight, um, that is a sign for us to start looking at what steps do we need to take, what precautions do we have to to be at. And so it, it, it's a, a good start, uh, especially with, with PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and with your current bill, it does specify that it would go to public health. Um, and then as the need occurs, uh, they distribute it accordingly. And I think that's a, a very good start. So all in general, uh, Guam Homeland is in support uh, with, with uh, public health. Public health is the lead and we help to coordinate uh, support resources and assets uh, as required during an emergency. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Ms. Perez, Mr. Luhan, did you have any? Hi, good morning, uh, Senator and uh, Chairman. My name is Cecilia Perez and I'm currently the EMS Commission um, Chairperson. The Commission also is in support of Bill 422-32 with the requested changes stated this hearing. I would like to say that the $130,000 is, is the beginning of, of such funding, and we thank you for that. However, I'd like to, with previous experience in um, other situations that public health has had to handle and GEFD has had to handle, and, and we also need to include the private sector ambulance services in the event that we may need to utilize them this funding uh, will need to be increased, just as Const uh, HSA Constantino mentioned, PPE itself, uh, protective equipment, um, those are disposable items. And disposable items are not cheap, um, especially if 
people start uh, or other states, areas start not hoarding them, but putting advance requests in to make sure their supplies are on hand, that they meet their needs. So I just like to point that out and um, humbly request um, that that be considered uh, for future funding areas um, because even though the public health will set up standards and guidelines and how we're going to disseminate that, I know just by experience and, and as an EMT, each time there is a run, we have to make sure, you know, there's just that disposable supply levels that have to be kept and that does not come cheap. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Perez, um, for your testimony and for your service as well. Uh, just to address th um, that uh, concern, um, this, this, as I said in, when I um, introduced this bill, this bill really is a, um, is a uh, proactive approach rather than a panic approach, right, to um, protecting our community. And with this um, small amount, 130000 is meant to, to ensure that we get whatever equipment we, we need, PPEs, right now. And then the bill also states that um, for subsequent, um, um, for any replenishment, if, they, if these are used, or for anything that any departments that are listed here will need um, to keep in stock, that, that it be requested through their budgets, their annual budgets. And so um, this is a start in the amount, but also start in the way that we develop um, our plan moving forward, is that um, now that, uh, uh, that we're asking the departments to ensure um, uh, that uh, they incorporate this in their requests uh, moving forward. So thank you very much for that. And also, one of the agencies that, that we have failed, that was overlooked um, to include was Guam Customs and Quarantine. So that is, uh, as one of the first responders as well, is being, uh, we'll make sure that they're included in, in the um, bill that's reported out of committee. Okay. Uh, Mr. Luhan, do you have any? Uh, my name is Patrick Luhan, Public Health Emergency Preparedness Manager. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm in also in support of this bill. Um, I understand that it is the front end of a long process, and being heavily involved in the Governor's Task Force for Communicable Disease and uh, engage with the 10 subcommittees that we've been meeting on a regular basis with the um, end result being the annex of the pan flu plan come the end of this month we are seeing a lot of items that we will present to this body to amend um, you know chapter 10 uh, dealing with the preparedness in, in the public health realm so I, I just um, like to share that with you and and look forward to working with your office and getting that heard and, and amended in the future thank you Thank you very much, Ms. O'Malley. Ms. O'Malley, anything? To okay, great. Senator Ogden. First of all, uh, when you initially, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. When the task force was initially impaneled, uh, you know, there were a lot of concerns out there by our, commu our community. And just by virtue of a lot of the activities you, that you've been carrying out and the discussions, I just want to come in and thank you all very much for stepping up the forefront and try to alleviate some of the concerns that our people have had because it requires uh, tremendous coordination, not only from the airport facility, should any visitors come in and be identified with uh, possible Ebola, but you've got Guam Fire, De Guam Fire Department, you've got an isolation room, you've got GMH involved in this, you've got Homeland Security, Public Health, and Public Health is taking the lead, and you've done a, a tremendous job just in the last couple of months in terms of being able to try to allay some of the concerns and the fears of our community. My only issue with regards to this is, and I'm, I'm surprised that a request was not put in for emergency procurement because you've gone through all this discussion uh, in terms of also the availability of $130,000, but you need the equipment here on Guam yesterday just by happenstance. Even though we continue to use the term remote, uh, that Guam would have an Ebola case, you know, just by happenstance, you need all of these supplies yesterday. So if emergency procurement, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest uh, that be part of the consideration of this legislation so that public health would be empowered to be able to procure or Homeland Security, whichever agency would procure these supplies and these PPEs, that that be provided. Another thing is the, uh, with regards to ongoing national discussions on Ebola. I know President Obama, I believe if not today, yesterday, uh, did travel 
to get an update to a particular state and to get an update in terms of all the national planning and the activities that are taking place to try to ensure that they address it in the mainland U.S. and obviously inclusive of Guam. But what is the most recent discussion, ongoing discussion in, regar in regards to trying to address this just so that our people would understand what you have all discussed, what you have all planned in addition to this legislation. What are some of the ongoing activities that are taking place? Are we getting any possible financial support from the, the national government? Do we need to apply? Is, is that where we can also seek some additional support? Or is this a situation where, okay, Guam, uh, we can set national standards, but you're on your own in terms of being able to, to fund the PPEs and some of the entire processes. So just so that our community understands what's been going ongoing so far. I, I do know that uh, Guam Memorial Hospital um, has uh, started uh, uh, procuring $55,000 worth of uh, equipment. Uh, equipment. Uh, and, I, and I know that they had to get approval from, um, I don't know what's the, you guys know the terminology, the Assistant uh, Secretary, H HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, Assistant Secretary to Emergency Preparedness, is that correct? Anyway, uh, they had to get approval and it was approved. So $55,000, um, they're already in the process. I do know that uh, Guam Memorial Hospital has also uh, donated um, a case, which is about 22 Tyvek suits to the fire department to ensure that if the uh, emergency was to occur right now, um, the Guam Fire Department, the Guam Memorial Hospital, public health would be uh, able to respond to the emergency. We are in consultation uh, with uh, the private sector as well. In fact, uh, Patrick Lujan here had a meeting uh, that included uh, the three major uh, clinics um, and brought them in to discuss uh, some of their responses and some of the things that we're doing. As a task force, all the different subcommittees met together uh, to basically let everybody know what each subdivision was doing. Um, or subcommittee was doing so that uh, we don't just have a tunnel vision, we have a broad scope and everybody is, uh, understands what's going on with that. Um, we've also had discussions um, uh, with, let's say, Guam, Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, uh, the Security and Safety Committee, uh, and just letting them know that they need to come up uh, uh, to the plate as well and also look at their industry because I remember a long time ago when I was part of that industry, um, we, when H1N1 came to this island some time ago um, as a uh, manager for one of the hotels, one of the things I had to come up with was a plan on how our particular hotel was going to respond to that emergency, which was uh, H1N1 at that time. And we did have a plan. We briefed it to CDC. And uh, basically, we, the bottom line was minimize contact with the, with the individual. Uh, we looked at worst case scenarios. We've had tabletop exercises. The tabletop exercises included uh, Guam International Airport. They had their tabletop, which involves a lot of other agencies. Uh, Public Health, I know, had their tabletop. Uh, and CDC was sort of uh, facilitating it. Um, Guam Memorial Hospital had their internal uh, tabletop. Again, CDC and Public Health were facilitating it. And then, of course, the Port Authority. Uh, with uh, in conjunction with the Coast Guard and other entities that do support this. So we're looking at all the different ports of entries as well as uh, the private clinics as well as the private sector to to get involved uh, and come up with a one direction solution um, because in the end uh, it's not just going to be one entity that's going to be responding but the island as a whole. Thank you very much uh, for that response, and, and I'm sh hopeful that our community is not only tuning in and understanding exactly all the effort that has gone into this entire process thus far. So, I mean, that just highlights uh, the, the activeness and, and you want to say proactive of, of the task force in terms of being able to try to address this situation. And now we're trying to, at the front end, not only identify the funding, but move in the direction of getting the PPE so that our community can continue to be assured that health-wise, should this remote chance happen in Guam, that the resources, all the different agencies, the private sector have already coordinated and have conducted some top tabletop exercises. Because that's very helpful to know. 
And, you know, with all these situations that are occurring nationwide, certainly Little Old Guam, here in our, our wonderful island, we have the stakeholders all participating in getting the proper exercises and the training and the education on regards to how to uh, address this should it ever happen here in our island. So I commend all of you and I thank you all for, for your efforts. But continue and please, the chairman is here and, and obviously you know that your legislative body is here to provide as much support as possible in conjunction with working with the executive branch. So I appreciate your response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to add, Mrs. O'Malley? Sure. Just to, just to add to what um, um, Mr. Cancelatino had, had mentioned, earlier on the, the federal government actually um, granted flexibility to, to public health, you know, who receives the public health emergency preparedness grant as well as to the hospital who receives the hospital preparedness grant to, you know, redirect funds to where, you know, there is a need. And that actually um, has has happened. Um, we do have at our as our part of our reach back the strategic national stockpile, you know, which is a resource in the event that we exhaust, you know, um, um, supplies and equipment that we need to respond, you know. So I know that in through the task force and just through the numerous meetings we've been um, engaging in with all our our key responders, that we do have, you know, um, supplies to respond you know, initially, you know, to, to you know, um, incidents that may occur. And then we have our reach back, you know, to again support us. Um, we are in the process of procuring, you know, some of the key um, equipment that is needed, especially for um, the fire, you know, the EMTs that will be um, transporting, you know, a, a um, suspect case, you know. So be assured, you know, that there's a lot of work in progress, there's a lot of planning, you know, to be better prepared so that we can respond more effectively. Add yes, please. I think, um, you know, since you, you guys are on TV and <clears throat> there's a uh, portion of the public that, that watches this and, and you're concerned with, uh, you know, the community concerns, uh, just to let you know, even prior to the nationwide media exposure, we've been under the surveillance and epi portion we've been watching this as well as other diseases throughout asia and throughout the world but on top of the um task force public health has also like uh, the hsa has said with the multiple tabletop exercises even with the coast guard that we've been involved with um, we continue to push out guidance and information uh, cdc has pretty much stabilized their guidance uh, over the last couple of weeks prior to that the last two to three months it was a continual almost weekly change mm -hmm. uh, even with PPE one week we were totally ready the next week we weren't ready um, and that's how much the change of, of this disease has taken place um, and affected even even us um, we continue to have briefings and major stakeholder meetings we met with the Guam Medical <coughs> Society we continue to work with the Guam Customs the airport operations committee would, which deals with all of their airlines um, and even their cleaning company uh, that, that cleans the, the airplanes, uh, private clinics as we mentioned and even private hotels. We've enhanced the laboratory procedures within public health. We've enhanced the surveillance and epidemiological procedures. Uh, we created a procedure and algorithm development with Guam Customs on how we would, we would respond to any type of potential um, patient under investigation. Um, under her office, we've trained over 250 Gov Guam and DOD personnel already on the virus. Um, and our director just was in Fiji reporting out to the World Health Organization. And according to him, we are in a better position than almost all the rest of the Pacific Islands uh, as far as preparedness is concerned for Ebola. And we continue our, our, our dialogue with the CDC experts and, and uh, Guam um, preparedness and with the status that, that's going on. Great. So just for your information, to give you a little bit of comfort and to give the community a little bit of comfort that we've been working really, really hard with our major stakeholders. And you're going to see this in case something does happen, whether it's Ebola or any other public health outbreak, that we're as ready as we could be and we continue to, be, to get it in a better posture. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. And I have no doubt that um, our government um, 
Public Health, Homeland Security, and the task force has been doing um, a lot to ensure that Guam is protected and ready. And so just like uh, I can't um, overemphasize that this, um, that this legislation really is a proactive approach and not something that's, you know, is a, it's not a panic approach to what may happen in, in, you know, in case of a threat to our community. So again, thank you very much for the work that you do and for being here. Uh, Mr. Casil, you're signaling for one just last one comment. Just one last comment, Senator. Uh, yes. just, just to show you how tight our schedule is, and I don't know if you're aware, but uh, we, we have been directed and, and have a mandate to, to, to finish our pandemic plan to update, you know, for, so it can accommodate Ebola and other communities by December 31st. So, so that time frame, right? So as, as you can see, uh, that, that is a lot of time frame, and yeah, we... Yes, our, our subcommittees and all these people are constantly working, updating, and, and, and so on. So we, uh, we really appreciate your, your bill. They're very timely, and, and uh, perhaps also it could be pa passed at the same time, and, and uh, you know, should, uh, God forbid, anything happen, we, we will be ready. You know? and so yes. with that, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Just one, one quick question, because obviously uh, continuity uh, binders are always very helpful in regards to situations like this. So are you following your disaster preparedness plan out of Homeland Security, where public health will step in and take the lead when it deals with public health? Or are you uh, moving forward based on all the suggestions and all the inclusion of, of the private sector, as well as government Guam agencies, just planning and moving ahead based on other plans other than the emergency disaster preparedness plan? We are, we are following the emergency plan, and in cases of, uh, of, of medical uh, emergencies, public, public health. health is the lead, yes. and, and we're following that plan. Uh, the other thing also is the basis of our plan is the Guam pandemic plan uh, out of 2008. We look at that, and, and that's the basis of how we respond to the emergency. But as uh, Pat had mentioned earlier, uh, CDC has changed protocols and because of the changes in the protocols, we had to uh, relook at the plan, uh, set up a task force, go okay. through tabletop exercises, meet with other uh, um, stakeholders. Um, and so we're trying to expand out uh, all, I mean, plans are, are great guidance, but in the end, uh, we always need to adjust what the threat is. And in this case, the Ebola threat is, is changing, I would say, the landscape of how the medical community responds. And, and because of that, um, I'm basically helping uh, assist, uh, with public health as the lead uh, in coordinating this, this uh, effort to basically update ourselves. Uh, and, and again, your, your, uh, your bill, this bill is very timely. Um, one of the great things is, is, is uh, uh, the interaction with us between our division as well as uh, you, 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 both you senators as our oversight senators. Uh, we, we coordinated with your, with, your, uh, with your sections to ensure that the communication is, uh, is both ways. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, so um, it's now 11.54 and this um, public hearing confirmation is adjourned, thank you. Thank you.